Welcome everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome everyone in to Wheaton Conversations with artists Paul Stankard and Shane Farrow. We're going to give everybody a few minutes to settle in and get uh, registered and joined in. And um, at this time, anybody who is here waiting, if you could please find the chat feature on your screen and let me know where you're from. Um, you can city, state, country. We might even have some out of state guests. So please feel free to note that in the chat. And, um, oh, okay, we have someone from Miami. Welcome. We have Virginia, LA, Millville, Houston, North Carolina. Thank you so much, Netherlands. That's awesome. We hope you enjoy your program tonight. This is wonderful. Lots of New Jersey. Thank you for representing New Jersey. Let's see who else is coming in tonight. New York. Welcome, New York. Philadelphia. All right. Media. Cape Cod, Massachusetts. This is great. Ithaca, New York. California, I thought I saw. Michigan. Another Florida. Massachusetts. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. I also, uh, while I have a few minutes to spare, wanted to talk about the next Wheaton Conversations we're going to have. And that is coming up on Thursday, September 24th at 6 p.m. And that is featuring Wendell White and Glynis Reed. And uh, Wendell White is a photographer, educator, educator, and cultural worker. And Glynis Reed is a professional visual artist, writer, and scholar. And Marcy, uh, throughout this evening, will be putting chats, uh, links in the chats, and she will be putting the registration for the next Wheaton Conversation with Wendell White and Glynis Reed in the chat box. So please feel free to click on that and register. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so tonight we will be joining um, Paul Stankard and Shane Farrow momentarily. But right now, I just wanted to make sure you had a comfortable viewing experience. And to this end, it is my pleasure to introduce Marcy Peterson, who will be handling all of our technical needs throughout the program. And Marcy has been with Wheaton Arts since 1994. She is the IT director, and her undergraduate and graduate studies were in fine art, e-business, marketing, and public relations. Marcy, can you provide us with some tech tips this evening? I sure can. And I just wanted to make sure you were seeing my um, slides okay, just to double check on the tech on my end. And so let me know if um, you don't. Um, so I am so happy to be doing this. Um, it's such a pleasure to work with Paul Steinker and Shane Farrow. I'm truly honored. Um, I just want to go through a few things before we start this exciting program. And first of all, uh, we just asked you to type some things in the chat and throughout the evening, you can continue to use that chat box to answer, ask questions for me. I'll help you if you ha need any um, technical in, um, assistance and I'll also be adding additional resources. However, this is a webinar. And in order to ask the par panelists questions, you'll use the Q&A window. And also you can like other attendees' questions when you're looking at um, through the questions. And then that'll uh, help identify the most popular questions and uh, should we not be able to get through all of the questions. We've got a lot of information or Paul and Shane have a lot of information to share with you. Um, should you lose connection for any reason, I want to assure you that you can simply close the windows down that are open now, go back to your original email, and you're going to be able to jump right back into the, the webinar, no problem whatsoever. Uh, this session is being recorded, and as this is a webinar, only the hosts and the panelists will be heard and recorded. Um, and one last bit of information that if you need to, you don't necessarily have to, but if you are using the chat and you find that it is a little too small, if you go to the upper left-hand corner of your screen on a, on a desktop, 
you'll see a little green icon. If you click on that icon, you will be able to go to accessibility and adjust the size of your chat. And as you're enjoying this free webinar brought to you by Wheaton Arts, I want to remind you that there are three types of support. And I'll briefly touch on membership donations and my favorite, shopping. But members get it all, no matter what. And gift memberships are all always available. So at your convenience, you can go over this wonderful list of um, membership benefits on our website. And I'll also share that link in the chat box. And that brings me back to the program. And I'm excited to introduce Noel Alampi, um, my coworker for quite a long time. And Noel Alampi joined Wheaton Arts Sales, the Wheaton Arts Sales team in 1997 and became the manager of the gallery in the paperweight shop a few late, years later. She has a BA in art history and a minor in women's studies from McDaniel College in Maryland. In her 23 years of service, she has developed relationships with collectors and artists alike. Noelle is, an enthousi is enthusiastic about meeting new artists and sharing her passion and knowledge of art, glass, and paperweights. And over to you, Noelle. Thank you, Marcy, for that wonderful introduction. So good evening, everyone who might just be joining us again. Thank you so much for joining Wheaton Conversations with artists Paul Stankard and Shane Farrell. Um, I want to read, we're going to start off with Paul, and then we're going to go to Shane. So Paul's bio, uh, we're gonna read a little bit through that to introduce Paul. Um, internationally acclaimed artist and pioneer in the studio glass movement, Paul Stankard is considered a living master who translates nature into glass. His work is represented in over 80 museums around the world. Paul is the recipient of numerous awards and honorary doctorate degrees. He is an artist in residence and honorary professor at Salem Community College here in Southern New Jersey. And Paul has authored three books, an autobiography in 2007 titled No Green Berries or Leaves, and an educational resource in 2014 titled Spark the Creative Flame. And most recently, Paul has written Studio Craft as Career, a guide to achieving excellence in art making. So I'd like to welcome Paul. How are you this evening? I'm fine. Uh, I'm Thank you so fine. much for well, joining us. You know, I'm excited to be here. This is, this is uh, wonderful that we not, in response to the, uh, uh, the coronavirus, uh, is being innovative in promoting excellence through glass art. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the work that uh, Susan Gogan and Marcy Peterson and yourself, Noel, have put into this project. It's really wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much. You know, um, Shane and I have known each other for probably 30, 40 years, I don't know. And, uh, and this is going to be an overview of Flameworks Class. We're going to talk about our work. Also, we have um, uh, we, we have a selection of work that shows the diversity of this uh, process. So, excellent. So, that's <laughs> what do we so do? <laughs> shall we get started? Yeah, go. <laughs> I think we have a video first. Yeah. This is Paul's video. This is a three, three and a half minute video. I'm, I'm, uh, Showing flame working, the flame working process. I have a, a Carlisle bench burner. Carlisle is a Millville uh, class equipment manufacturer. And uh, I'm using a gas oxygen flame, mm -hmm. making a petal uh, for the uh, flower that I'm going to build. And here's the green glass that I'm going to uh, produce. Uh, sepals and uh and you know it's it's really been a journey i've i've been sitting behind the torch now for for uh jesus 60 almost 60 60 years i don't believe mm -hmm. but for the last uh for the last 49 years i've been a studio artist working in glass focused on paperweights 
These are the individual stamens that will go into the blossom. Sealing the uh, stamens onto the uh, pistil. You know, the glass world is very tribal. And Shane and I uh, will share the inside information about flame working. Uh, flame working is a, a process that evolves out of glass blowing. It miniaturizes. Uh, oftentimes, it, it's a miniature effort to uh, melt glass and shape it and blow it and this kind of thing. I just put the petals on the flower. Now I'm sealing the sepals. And you have to get, I get both to seal the glass to the flower. I have to get it both hot and fuse it together evenly. It's funny. Uh, it's really been amazing how uh, nature and translating nature in glass and, and interpreting nature in glass has uh, taught me and educated me. My process has educated me to the, to the mysteries and subtleties of uh, the plant kingdom. I just uh, sealed the stem on the blossom. Now I'm going to uh, uh, put this Put the anther, the stamen has two parts. It has the filament and the anther. Now I'm sealing the anther on the glass filament, on the filament, and that will. Uh, I'll do it again. Yeah. Kind just. So that's the uh, blossom that will find its way into uh, my uh, floral designs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. And this is an example of uh, the, uh, I'm working on what I've titled the Poet Series, and I'm focusing on Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman to uh, 19th century poets that that I that have their words spark. I relate to them, and uh, I've internalized uh, poetry, paintings. Uh, I've internalized so much to to share, to express, and to nurture a certain artistic maturity for the work that I do. Uh, next. How do I, maybe, uh, maybe I can do hand signals, Marcy. <laughs> this is an interesting, this was made uh, 10 years ago or so. And there, I built five cubes and encapsulated my uh, floral designs into five cubes, cut and polished, laminated them together, and then laminated dark glass, dark green glass on the, on the back and then optical thick glass on the front and sides. And it and I like the illusion because it's like the glass is suspended in space. And the golden orb is a little bit of a mysterious, ambiguous component that celebrates uh, the spiritual. Here's an eight inch orb that was made in sections by uh, casting uh, four sides and then encapsulating honeybees in those sections, and then cutting and polishing and laminating it to the center core, I was able to build up this, um, this orb that is, uh, to me, very kinetic. If the honeybees are just buzzing around in there. And I have the hive, the flowers, the bees. And that's, that's been a very 
That's an ambitious piece. <laughs> very, very interesting. Next. Oh, my um, Mount Royal. Uh, when I was visiting Penland, first year I taught at Penland, it was the uh, middle of June, I think. And the Mount Royal blossoms were in full bloom. And they, they were surrounding the campus. They were, the campus was open, open fields and, and uh, flowering shrubs. And the mountain wall really touched me with the beauty. And up until Penland, I hadn't really noticed the mountain wall blossoms. So that became a, actually a, a five-year five year effort to, in, to translate th that illusion in glass. To, and um, didn't work on it all the time, but periodically I'd experiment and came up with this mountain wall blossom and felt uh, still feel it's one of my most successful plant, uh, flowering plants. Next. Here's uh, the uh, botanical series that I've cloistered, that I've uh, cloistered or laminated dark green glass on all uh, four sides, three sides, excuse me, and with a golden orb above suggesting a, a spiritual, a spiritual uh, dimension with the honeybee encapsulated in the, in the golden oak. Interestingly enough, the figures are, are very ambiguous. And uh, it's funny how people can interpret the, uh, the body gestures of the figures. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really my goal is to engage the viewer in a visual, in a visual, connect the viewer with a visual conversation, a mental, a mental experience that uh, celebrates the mysteries of nature, the beauty of nature, on and on and on. Next. This is recent. This is a uh, Walt Whitman's garden cluster, and uh, been making a, now. I, I'm I'm only 77, still a youngster. <laughs> what I'm enjoying is I come into the studio, and I'm in the studio four days a week. I'm making the components, and then I bring in Dave Graber, my assistant, who had been working for me for 25 years full-time and now he's on his he has his own career with his own body of work and he comes in helps me Friday mornings with my son Joe put it together and it's really uh, very very comfortable and I find it wonderfully satisfying to just take my time and just finesse finesse the, the glass and then have my two assistants come and help me put it together. So it's really been a nice, it's, it's a nice place to be for me. And uh, T. Rose bouquet with a mask. This was interesting because <clears throat> this was done in around 2000, well, 2004. For a long time, I was incorporating human forms into my flow designs and I got tired of it. And, uh, oh, I, but I like the idea of integrating a, uh, referencing uh, humanity in the designs. So I came up with what I call masks. And uh, this is the result of nestling a mask in what I, what I refer to as moss. So, so this is interesting. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And um, next, we're going to also introduce flamework artist Shane Farrell. I'm going to quickly read Shane's bio, and then we're going to bring in Shane. So Shane has been a flame worker for over 50 years and maintains a studio next to Penland School in North Carolina. He participates in international symposiums and conferences by lecturing and demonstrating. Shane is also an educator and has taught at institutions such as Penlin School, Urban Glass, the Pratt Fine Arts Center, the Studio of Corning Glass Museum, 
Pilchuck Class School, as well as internationally in countries such as Germany, UK, Italy, Tasmania, Taiwan, China, Australia, Turkey, and Japan. His work can be found in collections both private and public institutions worldwide. He has over 33 solo exhibitions since 1992 and has participated in 400 group exhibitions during his career. He has been honored with three retrospectives and numerous awards. His work can be found in over 30 museums worldwide. Shane, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be involved in this project for Wheaton Arts, which I have a long relationship with, and I have a long relationship with you and Marcy and Paul. Yeah. <laughs> uh, between Paul and I, we have 110 years experience. And then with um, Wheaton Arts being 50 uh, celebration there, uh, there's, there's 150, 160 years. That's true. <laughs> so um, of experience. <laughs> I want to thank the uh, audience for participating. I think it's wonderful that we have all these people on and I appreciate it very much. Um, first, we're going to show a video that was done by uh, Versteiner Beer, you know, like Red Bull does commercials for uh, people that are of interest. And I was asked to do this for a German beer company, Versteiner. And it's of my show and me working in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I, it's only a little less than three minutes, but I think it's interesting. Great. Thank you. My name is Shane Farrow. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. When I was 14, my family moved to Florida at about a half a mile from my house. It was like um, a German bohemian glassblower. And I used to ride my bike down there when I was 14 to watch him work. And then about maybe a year later, a younger guy bought the place that had a son my age. And I started by sweeping the floors and mowing the lawn. And within two months, they started training me. So I, I did class, you know, from the time of 15 through high school and college. That's how I paid for my college. There's something about glass that grabbed me. But ironically, I was taught more in the German styles of flame working, which is what I do. So the techniques that I use actually came from Germany and Bohemia. I'm influenced by art history in general, painters and sculptors. Uh, especially the Surrealists. In the same way that the Surrealists got a lot of their ideas through dream states, that's, that's how I got a lot of my ideas. Um, I actually would dream of going into somebody's studio or to some kind of gallery or something, and there would be all these pieces made in glass. And then, um, you know, I'd wake up and go, oh my God, you know, these things really don't exist. I made them up, you know. I took them from my environment and reconfigured them in my mind uh, through some kind of uh, subconscious psychological level. And now that's a basis for you know me being inspired towards those pieces. It's an ancient Greek term, it's called a rete, and it means excellence. It means you know, do it with excellence. It means do it right. So everything that you do, you try to do it the best as possible with as much passion as you can, you know. And it makes you happy if you can do it right. And, you know, it makes you a much better person as well. When you're doing something, you know, like glass, that you have to persevere, you have to keep pushing. And you, you may have to do jobs uh, in the interim that, you know, may not seem like what you want to do. There's not going to be, in general, instant success. You know, you're not going to become famous all of a sudden. Um, that you just have to try different things and eventually you know you will find your own path and if you persevere you're going to be successful. That was great. Thanks Shane. I love that figure you made at the end. Sit in the glass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of funny because they made me drink to, during that, and I don't drink when I'm working. 
<laughs> so that was kind of goofy. I said, I don't drink when I work. They said, you have to sit there and drink. Take a sip of three. You might, might, find a new, uh, <clears throat> might find a new illusion chain. That's true. That's true. I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. Um, you know, of course, you know, Paul and I have such a long history of work. We could talk forever. Um, I think that one thing that's kind of important is that, um, you know, through this process of learning about yourself and your work and all the processes involved, that your interests uh, reflect um, in the work, you know, that's the important thing. So um, not only have I been involved in flame working, but I've also been involved somewhat in mixed media and painting. Uh, I use photography sometimes to capture images that I <clears throat> translate into glass or in painting. I also uh, utilize hot glass, which I took a class at Penland School in 88 with uh, Stephen D. Edwards. And then the next year with Paul uh, Marioni, and I had just been a flame worker. I'd never worked with hot glass. I now make some of the larger pieces with a gaffer. Um, usually I use uh, Pablo Soto, uh, but in different residencies, I've used different people to execute the larger pieces. I could not make them by myself and I give them credit for it. So the uh, teapot on the left there is a piece where I flame draw on the color bubble and anticipate how the design will look later when it's blown out and I design the shape of it. Um, I do touch the piece. It's not like somebody is actually making it for me. And then when it's completely done, I do all the cold working, the grinding or polishing, sandblasting and the acid etching. And then I finish off the stoppers with uh, flamework glass, like those uh, tulips. And the right is a uh, ruby through to, throated hummingbird with uh, a nest that I found and manipulated and painted. It's quite a process. It actually takes me longer to mess with the nest than to make the bird. Next. Some of my um, older work uh, from the 1990s involved learning how to sculpt into larger forms with borosilicate glass. Mostly I use soft glass now. And so I you know, a lot of these pieces have elements of surrealism and mythology in them. The piece on the right is a modern, modern woman executive, which I thought of as kind of showing the strength of women. And it was made, it's about a foot tall and it was sandblasted. The sculpture on the left, Speculum Alchemy, is about the birth of my daughter here before. And that's me in the back there, the little devil. Um, and it's also been sandblasted and I've used plate glass also in the sculpture. It's about 21 inches wide and about 14 or 15 inches tall. Next. In 1993, I started making uh, shadow boxes. Um, although I had put pieces in shadow boxes, little pieces that I had made, uh, I met Fred Burkill at Penland, I was uh, his assistant in 1988, and he gave us a project of making shadow boxes. I was already familiar with them through Joseph Cornell and some of the other artists. Um, so I started making them in 93 and utilized collage photographs. I would paint parts of it and I would interpret the backgrounds and then make glass pieces to respond to those. Later on, I started just painting the entire box and did not use collage. Next. Back the other way, yeah. Um, everybody knows me from my birds. I've always had a fascination for birds throughout my life. I had a gallery when I was 24 years old in Plattsburgh, New York and you know had gone through eight years of apprenticeship and finally i could make whatever i wanted there and one thing that interested me being in the adirondacks were the birds and i would do hikes and i belonged to the audubon society and i started making small birds and solid glass out of italian glass of different species probably worked up about 80 
But I was also, when I was younger, taught to blow uh, birds with tubing. And although what I made back then was kind of kitschy, I started to reinterpret them, um, especially in 2002, uh, after 9-11, I wanted to make some kind of work that was happy and kind of dealt with uh, spiritual aspects, uh, positive things rather than the malaise and kind of the depression caused from 9-11. So the piece on the left is a, a collaboration between Elizabeth Brim, who's a local blacksmith, um, very well known throughout the United States. And she made the uh, iron and steel and I made the birds. Uh, we've made many pieces. The piece on the right is another natural nest with birds. And I make things like acorns and fruits and other kind of accessories that kind of uh, round out what my concept is next. Um, when I started painting uh, shadow boxes, I started painting more just using canvas, large scale canvas, like 30 by 40, and also watercolors. And I found that the, the combination of going back and forth between the mediums when kind of brought a different kind of uh, feeling for things. So maybe I would draw something and then make it out of glass. Or sometimes I would use glass and then paint it, which uh, I don't have any examples here, but I would make something out of glass and then paint it and be in, inside the particular painting. This is an ink drawing on, on paper from when I was in uh, Paris um, a year ago, January, uh, at the Louvre. And the piece on the right is is a 30 inch tall piece that was gaffed by Pablo Soto. And that's my impression of going into Taiwan and China and the mountains there. Uh, next, these are a couple watercolors. I usually see birds um, around my house or in places I'm at traveling around the world. And then I decide to paint them. And uh, in looking at them, I generally feel like I should uh, uh, utilize some aspects of them in my glass pieces. Next. Uh, this piece uh, I finished uh, not too long ago. It's actually right now in the Renwick uh, uh, Alliance uh, art auction going on right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> So Paul, we, I'm gonna start. So Ken and I thought we'd start with the ancient glass, and uh, we. I met Shane, and at, uh, I've known I I knew of Shane's work, but I met him at Corning, and believe it or not, I met him. We were both. Yeah, I walked up to the display case to look at the ancient beads, and we were both looking at this this uh, head. This bead that was made 2,000 years ago. And I recognized Shane from, uh, from his uh, publicity throughout his career. And we started talking and uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. But uh, <clears throat> this bead, Shane, I don't know, Shane, can you elaborate? I mean, it's flame work, but it's also, I think it's also, uh, cut and polished. I mean, they use a lot of different processes for this one. Yeah, I mean, kind of the problem in the history of um, flame working is that a lot of the processes aren't really understood by museum curators. Um, I think that, you know, many times they've had to rely on us to try to figure out how things are made. And since we weren't there, we don't exactly know. But if you look at the, um, the eyebrows and the eyes, um, I think that probably some sort of a torch was used for that. And then the beard section, like Paul said, it looks like it was carved into. It could have been done with some kind of a knife or something like that as well, but looks like it might be carved. Yeah. Well, we're going from uh, ancient up to the, what, 1600s? Six, uh, maybe 17. Yeah, with the African trade. With the African trades, these are amazing. 
they had an industry in Mavano uh, where they had, uh, they were flame working the African trade beads. And this was currency. And interestingly enough, these beads have been found all around the world. That's true. And, and they were using at the time, we'll show you in a few slides forward, uh, the apparatus that they were using to uh, melt the glass in the flame. They had, uh, well, I won't jump ahead, but uh, it's amazing how this was currency in, uh, in the uh, middle centuries, middle ages. Right. Next. Okay. These are, um, you know, there, there's, they keep finding them, but there's various prints of flame working. Uh, these aren't the earliest. The earliest I've seen was from uh, probably in 1660s or something like that. And the only reason that we knew about the ex kind of the exact date was because of the clothing wearing that the person was wearing in the uh, image. Usually they're prints that were made because they didn't have photography back then. So this Diderot here is uh, shows a typical example of what a fire uh, table or you know lamp working table looks like you have a bellow system if you look down under the table you can see that he's pressing against the bellows and the air is compressed into a diaphragm so it has a constant pressure and then that air is mixed with the fuel source that produces a flame that's hot enough to melt the glass and, and you know that's where the term lamp working Right. Originated. They had an alcohol lamp. They had the foot pedals blowing air into the flame to enrich the flame. And uh, it, it was very effective. It was suited for small scale work. Interestingly enough, very, uh, recently, over the last 20, 30 years, the uh, studio glass movement with the with the creative energy and, and expectations, art making expectations, um, many people, I think more people, refer to lamp working as flame working. Well, we had something to do with that too, because Suzanne France, who is the curator of modern glass at the Corning Museum, and you and I and some other people actually got together uh, and other people and decided that lamp working was could change to flame. Really ambiguous, really. Yeah. We because were, people thought we were working on making lamps instead right. of... <laughs> we, 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 we use a gas oxygen uh, bench burner. We have bottled gas, propane and oxygen, and it's quite different, but, but you, you can see the uh, the process going back to the earliest uh, days next um i added these pieces um you know i never was a scientific uh flame worker uh paul was but you know when i was young you know i saw scientific apparatus and actually probably repaired some i know i repaired some but I knew of this place in Florence, Italy, that um, it's called the Accademia di Cemento, and it's a place where the Medici's in the 17th century set up a 10-year project with artists and scientists to ex exchange ideas during the Renaissance. And that included artisans that did flame working. And a lot of the original uh, scientific apparatus, which is still true today, was made by flame working techniques. These coiled things that are in front of the rooster there are the precursor to the modern <clears throat> thermometer. It was designed by Galileo. So I was in uh, there in 2018 and finally got to photograph some of these things. But I find what I find interesting is the combination of using artistic kind of concepts with scientific together which uh, is very appealing to me. Next. Well, let me, 
let me make this one point and you can elaborate on it if you want. Go ahead. The, uh, I, uh, a scholar, two scholars tried to um, overview the history of Western knowledge, advances in Western knowledge. And uh, they, they ended up with about 30, 30 some examples of how the West advanced through scientific uh, experiments. And um, in glass, at the time it was mostly lampwork glass, glass was responsible for about 25 or 26 of the experimentation. Without, without glass, the experiments wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, uh, been successful. And also, some of the experiments took advantage of past experiments that were, that were um, the result of glass facilitating the information, which is really interesting when you think about it. Yeah, the, the book uh, Glass of World History by uh, Alec McFarlane. Um, yeah, I mean, just, just the idea of glass, well, I don't know if, if any of you were at the um, gas conference in Corning in 2016, but it was really interesting because the <clears throat> keynote speaker was uh, from Corning and he talked about glass, this is the glass age. And it kind of extends from what Paul is talking about, how we are using glass in our phones and bendable glass and about everything that they're uh, developing involves glass in terms of, you know, communications, you know, optic fibers, everything. You know, uh, a hair is three thousandths of an inch mm. in diameter in a fiber optic, fiber, a fiber for fiber optics in communications is ten thousandths of an of a inch. Right. And they can put like a hundred thousand telephone conversations into one ten thousandths of an inch diameter fiber optic. That is magical, Shane. I know. It's Unbelievable. So, so here, let's continue on along our historical journey. Yeah, do you want to start talking about these Nevers? Nevers figurines, yeah. The Nevers figurines were produced in the 1700s. And uh, Corning has a, re a beautiful collection of some of the masterworks in that body of work. And we have uh, a beggar, which is about two and a half inches in, in height, and very, very dramatic. And he's, uh, he's, he's uh, very credible. And this was done with uh, heating colored glasses I think they called themselves enamelists, I believe, instead of flame workers or lamp workers. And they, they reheated the glass and they, they reinforced the figures with wires. And they applied glass to the, to the, the frame, the, the, uh, the right. armature, the wire armature, and came out with fascinating Fascinating results. And then the, this Nevere figurine, I think is one of the high, high watermarks in, the, uh, in that, whole, that whole period, uh, Marie, Marie Antoinette. And this was right before she got her head cut off. And it alludes to her with the cherub, with the winged cherub, it alludes to the, her spiritual right to be the queen and there's quite a bit of scholarship surrounding this piece. Uh, now that I'm only 77, I forgot most of it. <laughs> but what the heck, I can still appreciate this tabloid. What a, what a, what a fascinating example. And I think, you know, Shane, we talk about this a lot. You know, it takes a tremendous amount of dedication and perseverance to establish a career in class. And, but you're also competing with the best from the past. Right, exactly. And you want to you overview, you know, you, 
you want to overview the history of the process and 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 perfect techniques that will advance the process into the 21st century. Exactly. It's fascinating. Next. Here we have uh, some more examples. Um, actually in uh, Murano before, uh, actually probably in other places, but Murano and I know Austria, I have examples of it, but we can't fit everything into this particular presentation. Um, they used the Never figures and in Murano, the same thing. They did flame worked figures and animals and different things like that. And they used them in a mixed media context where they used shells and cabochon stones. They use um, wood and different things to build up a diorama, um, a re religious reliquy, different things like that. Actually, I actually saw a, um, a table from Louis XIV that collected it and, and they used it for banquet tables, which was nice. amazing. Well, you know, um, they didn't, it's fascinating. These Nevere figurines were a response to China was producing small scale figurines and animals in porcelain and they were sending them to Europe and the, and the wealthiest people, generally royalty, were the only people who could afford them. So the flame workers or the lamp workers or the enamelists, they started to mimic uh, what had been done in porcelain mm -hmm. and it became quite a quite an industry, cottage industry throughout Europe. And uh, what's interesting is there are wonderful examples. And then there is, I think, uh, cartoons. But uh, it's interesting how this whole body of work was a response to uh, replicating what, the, what porcelain was able to do. And, uh, and I think that the glass could match what awesome people were able to do. Next. So this is my world, uh, strange, strange world, paperweights. I started out in 19, in Southern New Jersey. I live in Southern New Jersey. And paperweight making was a wonderful tradition and I, I, I think that paperweights were the crown jewel of the South Jersey glass tradition. And they were made at the end of the day, factory, factory the, the gaffers and the glass blowers would make these uh, end of the day glass and they would trade them for, for beers at the bar or maybe sell them for a couple of bucks or whatever. And they had today the Millville Rose and Devil's Fire and examples, some of the examples of these turn of the 19th century, uh, turn of the 19th century uh, glass industry uh, are now, the objects made in 19, early 19th century, are now sought after antiques. But we have, uh, this is a, a Baccarat crystal paperweight from France. These are all French paperweights. So, the Italians uh, were playing around with encapsulating colored glass and sears, uh, cones, and they came up with a kind of a egg-shaped uh, form with colors, little furies floating around. They really didn't know what to do with it. And then about 50 years later, the French was, um, the French was, uh, looking for a product because the glass industry was a little depressed. Interestingly enough, paper making was just beginning to be perfected. And also with paper making, with paper being available, the educated people started to correspond. So correspondence, writing letters was a very, very fashionable 
a fashionable way of communicating. And the, and the glass industry developed what was called uh, paperweight to hold down the papers. And we have the uh, Pantan paperweight, which was a major effort. The flame worker made the, uh, the salamander, then sent it to the cutting room and they cut the, uh, the scales on that, on that uh, uh, salamander. Shane, I think that they, they had it, I think the salamander was straight and they cut it so that it would be manageable to cut and then somehow they bent it into shape. That's what I think too. They, they probably softened it up a bit. And then moved it, moved it around. They couldn't heat it too much or it would remove the scales. Exactly. So, so you know, uh, so that was, that, these were, there were about five or six, I think five known and they're very sought after. They, if they sell, they I think one sold for $300,000 recently. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the salamander paperweight. Now the next uh, is a millefury close pack. And the Miller Furies uh, uh, were very popular, but they were made at the, to at the furnace where they would gather glass and make and ex extrude these long canes, slice them up with the patterns inside. So that's, uh, so this is the early stages. This is the beginning of my career. And early on, I wanted to, I wanted to build on that tradition and I wanted to, make instead of doing uh stylized designs i wanted to focus on native flowers okay next this is uh this is my assistant dave graver beautiful wonderfully talented man he's a bit of a poet and romantic i think he's a romantic at heart and he had uh, a cutter I think uh, Poor from uh, Cape Cod cut his his forms with um, undercut with a pattern and then showcase his uh, flame worked uh, fruit and in this case flowers and they're very very attractive uh, and I think that Dave is and myself but Dave represents a whole new growing number of young people taking being challenged by the flame working process and making fascinating paperweights that are taking that are really uh attracting a lot of attention among the collectors and i think that because they're studio artists making uh one one of a kind sometimes two or three of a kind uh it's not a production effort what mm -hmm. say you, Shane? Yeah, I I definitely agree. Um, Fascinating, isn't it? Next, let's go on to uh, the Blaschkas, who were Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka from Dresden, Germany, and they owned their family owned a glass factory, which also made parts for jewelry. So they had that as a background and they decided they wanted, you know, as actually the uh, scientific world was starting to categorize and study the different animal and plant kingdoms, uh, basically they needed uh, examples for universities and for museums or study of these animals. So people started making models for them. And the thing is, is that they competed actually with some other people, but these are all flame worked out of basically tubing. And you remember that table you saw with the foot fellow system, that's how they made these. And some of them are actually quite large. Nobody really knows exactly how they were made and nobody's been able to replicate them in the flame working world exactly. Um, initially, I think that they painted and used horse glue and because of their mixed media background with jewelry and everything, they were able to manufacture these. 
later on, they started using more and more glass that they formulated themselves to kind of enamel the pieces to give them proper color. But it's pretty mind boggling to think of using a foot bellows system to make these pieces. Um, so this is what they started with next. Then, um, uh, the uh, Elizabeth Ware of the, uh, was a patron of the Harvard Museum, Harvard School, the Peabody Museum. She and other patrons wanted to commission the Blaschkas to make plants. So they got like a basically a 50 year contract uh, to make these pieces. And uh, they had to be made in Dresden and, you know, sometimes they actually would travel to find specimens. They also had uh, uh, Wilhelm's, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm's collection, botanical garden that they could work from. But as far as a lot of stuff in the United States, they had come. Interestingly enough, I found that the sun actually came near Penland uh, to Roan Mountain, which is right near us recently. Um, and I thought that was really cool because Appalachia is botanically rich because you have the north and the south meeting in, in the mountains here. This particular piece is uh, red maple and supposedly took 10 years to formulate all the colors that they made, the enamel glass, uh, to get it right. And you can see that using the the uh, branch and all the stems and things, those are metals that are attached to each other that are covered with enamels. Next. I like you know, this is uh, This Shane is an exact reference to you. <laughs> <laughs> Shane talks about the blasters. I, I didn't know that at times they would spend up to five, 10 years to yes. develop the illusion. And it's fascinating when I when I was first challenged to uh, interpret the uh, mountain law in glass. I I experimented for about four or five years right. trying to nail it, and it wasn't until I came back from a show in Florida. I had a show at the Habitat Gallery in Florida. I was kind of worn out. I was. I had a decent show, so I wasn't just going to rush right back into the studio and, and make more work. I wanted to uh, experiment. I started to experiment with the, the Mountain Law and, and um, you know, you often, I would hear occasionally, Shane, the artists would say, you know, I had a dream and, and, and when I woke up, that, that helped me uh, complete the piece. And I think, huh, oh, yeah, I don't know if I buy that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when I was about 30 days into this, because I was determined I was going to nail it, I was going to get a right, whatever a right is. And I started to, uh, <clears throat> I was getting tense and getting frustrated because there was an economic uh, dimension to the whole thing. I was, wasn't making any money and you know, life goes on. So one night I went to bed right before I fell asleep. I had a, an idea how to, how to solve one of the technical problems. And when I woke up, boom, it was so clear to me. I went into the studio and I hit a hand, a grandstand home, grandstand home run. So, so now I'm waiting for more dreams. <laughs> there are few, yeah. there are few, and far between. Next. Well, you know, the interesting thing about all those pieces uh, that they made were, as I said, they're made out of tubing. Um, and some of the leaves are incredibly long, uh, you know, bit, pretty large scale, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty, you know, I've seen a few people like replicate them sort of and now people are able to like cast them in pot de bear techniques and things like that but th they were making them with tubes of glass it's incredible and they also uh, the blaskers would take enamels and they would take a candle and they would paint the enamels onto the clear glass uh, they were using micros microscope 
slide class. Right. In some instances. And then yeah. they would take the candle and they would melt. They would fuse the enamel onto the plate glass. Right, exactly. I mean, they really had a lot of uh, personal techniques that uh, probably, I can't imagine, first of all, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be challenged to, to match or build on the blast for flowers, it's not gonna be the way they did it. No, I don't. We have technology and the technology is going to lead us to a different, in a different direction. Right. Well, um, I'm going to move on, but I'm, we're still covering Germany here. This is Albin Schadel. He was a scientific flame worker. There's a town in formerly East Germany in Thuringia. So it's a, it's kind of like around Penland and in, 1497, the Duke of Coburg, which is the largest city near there, and the Dukes of Coburg owned a lot of glass, uh, a lot of Murano glass, actually. They have, Cesare told me they, he thought they had one of the, they had more glass than they have in Murano, uh, the history. Yeah. Uh, I, have a, I have a huge book of all of it that they collected. But, you know, Germany was a big area, and this particular town, was founded by two families and they had a factory and they manufactured glass, um, evolved glass, they call it the green glass of the forest. They were um, probably for about 800 years ago, they, they, they had glass factories and they'd move and they'd to different parts of the forest and stuff and then use the forest to, to uh, for the furnaces. And sure. then they have, sure. then they have to move the, move them uh, to another area. Well, this particular area is really interesting. I've been there many times and it's kind of nestled in between these two mountains. And so when they made stuff out of the furnace, they also made tubing and rods. So people had their own studios in their houses, usually in the bottom part. And they made things like Christmas ornaments and jewelry and figurines and various things. Elbin Schadel lived just a little to the north of Lausha. And being from a scientific uh, background, he knew how to handle tubing. And he started making various pieces by uh, twisting up and using different colored tubes that he would use, fuse them together. Talmo technique, where you're butting one color up against the other. <clears throat> Then he would blow out that, and then he would change the access of the bubble by blowing out a hole and adding another tube. You know, flame working uh, is able to accomplish, uh, to work the glass in a way that is highly unlikely that a glass, of, a blown glass on the end of a pipe could, could do it. There's so much control with the flame working process. It's fascinating. And well, Schiegel started you know, a whole new, uh, new you direction. Know, you know, I was talking to Lino Tagliapetra about, because he, he does that sort of technique on the pipe, but he said that basically that wasn't really done until, I don't know, 60s or 70s or somewhere in there. The German um, pipe. No, I mean in, in Murano off the pipe. They yeah. Didn't, they didn't utilize this technique. Um, it kind of came from there. Next. Can I, excuse me, Shane and Paul, I just wanted to chime in. That is, uh, we're halfway through. Okay, right. we're Thank doing you. good then. Do you have good. Any, question, okay. any questions uh, that uh, you'd like us to answer, Noel? I we see do. some. Yeah, we do actually. Paul, one was uh, for you. Um, one of the Lois actually wanted to know if your parents or grandparents were artistic. My parents were depression. <laughs> we're, we're from the de depression era. So their whole advice to the family was learn a trade, educate, <laughs> and get a good job. Uh, the idea of being an artist was not promoted. And my grandfather was an engraver, very talented. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and I used to go to his room. He lived in the house. Go to his room and watch him, uh, watch him 
uh, draw very, very ornate botanical imagery on the edges of the newspaper. You know, there wasn't any, uh, you didn't have uh, clear sheets of paper. You would use scraps from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. but, uh, right. but you know, it's, uh, I believe personally, uh, I don't know if Shane's feeling, but we all are creative one way or another, and we have to find that, that find what it is that's important to us. That's true. And, and you know, I think that most artists, often artists become obsessed with their work. And you know, it's like, oh my God, my wife is, I don't know, in the 80s, my wife said, you know, Paul, <clears throat> you need a hobby. It's a hobby. Yeah, you, all you do is class. All you talk about is class. I said, well, that's my hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, it's been a beautiful journey, still is. I feel, you know, flame working is basically a small version of glass bomb. Right. And the trick <laughs> is to integrate it into glass bomb. Like Shane does a combination of blown vessels and, and uh, his components that become part of that, uh, that sculptural effort. And for me, uh, <clears throat> I use co-working. I cut polish, laminate, and, you know, it's really been an interesting, uh, interesting uh, deal. Thank so, you so much. Aaron, Aaron just, hello, Aaron. <clears throat> what did Aaron ask? Let's see. Aaron showed up with a question. Oh, Aaron actually asked if you uh, would you consider the work that you are making right now, both of you, the best in your career? I do. You know why? Because I'm not trying to prove anything. <clears throat> I'm not trying to make it big. I'm focused on my four inch orbs and then the cubes. The banded cubes. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm articulating a body of work that's been inspired by, um, by my love of nature, but also by literature. I just started. I just read for the third time. I can't make any sense out of it. Uh, having a senior moment here. Uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote an essay on nature. And I'm thinking, oh, I got to read. I read it 20 years ago, and I just reread it. And I said, I listened to books on tape. I listened to literature on tape. I listened to it, and I thought, this is crazy. I don't, this is all abstract. This is godly goof. And I'm thinking, what is going on? So I, I listened to Emerson's essay on nature for the second time. And to me, it doesn't make any doesn't compute. Isn't that interesting? So. That is amazing. And Shane, I had one for you actually. Someone in the chat asked, if you could invent any type of glass tool, what would you invent and how would you use it? Hmm. Well, <laughs> actually, <clears throat> I mean, some tools are necessary. I actually like having the least amount of tools I can. So I actually want to be able to use my hands uh, in different ways that, and my body movements really. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a tool geek, but I, I enjoy them and I actually <laughs> buy tools, but then I go, well, you know, I don't really need that. <laughs> you know, my, you know my, my, answer. my take on tool, Shane, my challenge is to make the glass, bring a certain spontaneity to the glass. And right. I think flame working is really about certainty. It's, it's, it's really not a lot of spontaneity associated with flame working. But with tools, it's less spontaneous. Yeah, I mean, you know, lots of people are using lathes in uh, work, especially like in the pipe world now. And of course, yeah. in specific and design work. 
And, you know, I played with it, but I like the freedom of movement to be able to just use my body, gravity and the flame to, to do a lot of the work. Well, you're right. I mean, it's about, for me, it's about spontaneity. Yeah. And uh, that, that brings a certain amount of magic to the whole thing. Right. Which brings me to this uh, slide here. This is Elbrecht Griner Mai, and he was one of the most uh, well-known of the montage artists in Laosha using tube tubing. So these are in Kelmo pieces where he took tiny bits of tubes <clears throat> that he fused together over and over again until he sealed them together and then, yeah. he, he and then you blow them out I, i've done this yeah. in a lot of pieces myself but they're beautiful shapes and forms Next. you know they really well let me say this go back they okay. they belie the tremendous effort to make them yeah they're very very labor intense they're beautiful they're very simple they're, it's minimal yeah it? but the, yeah the, that leads to the big effort to do that. Yeah, that leads to the next slide. Uh, Kurt Volstab was also from Laosha, but um, being East Germany, he escaped through the mountains at night. It's a mountainous area, and went to West Germany, and he communicated with the rest of the people in East Germany, and. These are the same kind of things where you're uh, in Kelmo, but you're changing the axis of the bubble constantly. So you have those twists and moves and everything. And talking about time, you know, basically you have to make all the little parts. Say so you have 40 little parts of tubing. You have to make them and have them ready to work when you start to make the piece. So one of these pieces might take a couple, two or three days to actually make just one, one piece. You know what I think is really magical? If an artist like you and I can make our labor invisible. Right. Exactly. I don't want people to look at my work and say, oh, the poor, poor guy labored over that. Right. I want it to be just, wow, magical. How did he do it? Exactly. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not the type of person that took me two days to make this. I would rather have people think that it's it took it took you sixty years to make it. <laughs> That's how long it took. Yeah. Next. Anyways, I studied with Kurt Volstab, um, assisted him at Pilchuk in 1991, and got to know him. Um, actually, his daughter became a teaching assistant for me at Corning back. Oh, nice, in nice. Yeah. Um, this is his uh, protege here, Andre Gutkesel. These techniques are still done in Laucha, but when, uh, when East and West Germany reunified, uh, it changed the market and these people aren't doing it quite as much anymore. So Andre Gutkesel is a modern version of it. He's really good at a sense of design and, um, of course, the pieces on the left are in Calmo, but the piece on the right is uh, is a montage piece. But it's actually a, a pretty large piece just made out of tubing. And it's kind of cool that they, you know, you can go down to the factory on your bicycle and you got a basket in the back and you just pick up whatever uh, tubing or rods you want. And they make them make the same color in all sizes of tubings and rods. So it's amazing. Next. This is uh, Victorian. Uh, we're on the Victorian. Uh, we're in the we're in the island of Murano, and uh, well, not Murano because he his studio is in Venice. Oh, okay. Well, Victorio Constantini has distinguished himself for a lot of years with the insects, among other things. But the insects, I think, are what he's most known for. Shane. Next. Well, um yeah but he's so so many different things like these shells that he makes Isn't that um, amazing they look like oh. uh, somebody had quite a feast well i gotta tell you a funny story because he's 
he lives actually on the mainland and takes a train in. Um, he's got gardens and stuff like that. Yeah. And he's got his shop in Venice. But he's really interested in what is in the sea and what's in the lagoons, you know? Yeah. And, you know, if you go to dinner with all these guys when you're in Venice, they'll argue about is the fish or the shellfish better from the lagoon or from the sea, from the Adriatic Sea? And it's quite funny. Next. Here's another example, Ray's. He actually makes a lot of his fish um, with a, a miniature blowpipe because his background was in furnace when he was a teen, you know, less than a teenager. So he starts with a bubble at the end of a tiny blowpipe and colors it and rolls it in enamels and frit and stuff like that and then starts to shape it. Next. This is uh, Cesare Tofolo. Cesare is quite a, has distinguished himself on, on a glass landscape in Murano, actually distinguished himself on the international glass landscape. Cesare's father was a scientific glass blower, I believe, and, but Cesare had furnace working experience, as his grandfather did, and he took, Cesare took traditional glass blowing tools and used the glass blowing tools in combination with the bench burner to produce some very, very interesting forms and shapes and was able to manipulate the glass in a very special way. So here's one of his uh, vessels that he um, turned into uh, an idea, painting, uh, uh, <laughs> it's really a, a, a wonderful little, little story about the little figures uh, working on the gold leaf and the painting, the, well, it has, he references a lot of painting, uh, and actually he does a lot of work that probably you haven't seen unless you go to his place where he actually like looks at paintings that have glass in them that are from the Renaissance, and then he tries to reproduce that glass. Yeah. So a lot of us use paintings and artwork to reference and continue our work. Um, Here's a, here's a photograph of one of his pieces that very poetically shows the silhouette of the, of the vessel and the little human form, the little figures interacting on the, uh, on the vessel. That, kind of interesting. That, that's from, uh, you know, I write articles for the Glass Quarterly and I, you know, Paul writes a lot. You know, he just has three books and he writes articles too. But, um, you know, I think from that photograph, you can see like, you know, the poetry, uh, the symbolism that's in his mind when he makes a piece, I think it symbolizes it very well. Yeah. Next. Next. This is really, I think, very impressive. This is uh, building on the Nevea figurine tradition, but He's using borosilicate glass instead of the uh, uh, the soda lime glass. And, and like I believe the these these pieces are much more stable than what was done in the 1700s. Right. And they're probably annealed. And I don't believe that there's wire uh, reinforcement. I don't believe there are wire amateur on them. I think the borosilicate glass is an industrial strength glass that could handle the, uh, you know, could certainly handle the uh, stability and make the stability of that effort. Well, you know, the, it's interesting because I've seen underneath them, you know, the dresses on the women are hollow. So that's tubing, you know, they're not, they're, they're not solid pieces. Yeah necessarily their combination next yeah he, he also does some other uh like uh commedia dell'arte p 
pieces like that that are solid. Lucio well, Babaco, great friend of both of ours. Well, Lucio is the person. He's quite a, well, they're all great people. You know, Shane, I feel so fortunate. And I know we both know people and good friends with people from around the world. Exactly. So glad. We know the, the, you know, it's we're flame workers, but because the work is respected, we're part of the larger glass community, studio glass community, glass art. But uh, certainly we can, we have a special bond with uh, the, uh, the flame workers. Right. Lucio, he's the man. I think the Lucio's figures are as good as the historical best. Oh, yeah, for it's sure. It's fascinating. And here is, uh, he does a lot of myth. Myth, they're all, you know, it's, and they're all celebration, they're celebrating. He's into, this is a, uh, a grouping that is a hypothetical reference to goblets for the most part. Right. And here on the other side is uh, Lucio's got, a, got an interest in the devils. <laughs> well, he, he has like, you know, being brought up uh, Catholic, you know, he always uh, had- You're gonna had tell me he's repudiating his Catholic background? No, no, I don't mean that at all. I mean, in his mind, you know, he's talked to me about this. In his mind, he's like, he enjoys this conflict between good and evil. Yeah, hell and uh, heaven, you know. Yeah, I mean, and that, he, he does a lot of work relating to that. Next. I think this is really something that uh, is really very dramatic. It's uh, a boat, and uh, and they're all paddling. I guess they're paddling in unison. Well, it's like a it's like a pilgrimage of um, of people. You know, yeah. that it's important to him. It's important to him because of the boat issue in uh, in Morocco. And I said that's how they get around. You know, that exactly. it's very important to them. Exactly. Um, I think these are beautiful pieces. Be they are beautiful. Shane, if I'm going too fast, you just let me know. Come back oh, up. Okay. It's fine. Okay, back. Marshall. There's another piece. This is another piece. Same That's one. That's beautiful. I, I find his work very, very poetic. Next. He's a legend. Lucho's a legend. Um, and here we have Amber Cohen. Yep. And Amber is, uh, she graduated uh, emerging, uh, well, she she's well-respected and well-known, but Amber started out, I guess, about 10 or 15 years ago, and she's, she graduated from uh, Tyler School of Art and took up flame working. And uh, she uses colic. Uh, crushed caught bottles and vessels and things and she pieces that are broken up already yeah and she broke pieces glass. that were already manufactured and she kind of manipulates them exactly and she does a remarkable job um with that whole concept of she frames she frames her glass onto uh uh i don't know it looks like plywood a hot surface and she affixes it onto a surface for wall models. Next. The one on the left, uh, Shane, is from Corning. So right. she must have, I don't know, did she get the uh, Great Cow Award? I don't remember, I, you know. I, 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 think she, I think she did, actually. Well, she's certainly worthy of it. And then to the left is uh, uh, Call it she was, she she was, a, she was a student of mine back in 2006 at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. Well, she's a wonderful person. She is. And very, very talented, dedicated. Incredible. You know, one of the things that has to be said is the people that are being shown through this slide presentation have really dedicated their, their creative energy and to, to glass, mm -hmm. into their... Into their 
personal language that they've invented to share what they care about. It's really remarkable. And, you know, the whole thing is, is that a lot of them shared with us, we shared with them. And we sure. have a community that is intent on building a, a better narrative, a better language for our medium. Well, I think that flame working is the, is the growth process on the contemporary glass landscape. I think that it's very economical. And we're seeing more and more uh, creative people with bachelor's and master's degrees gravitate towards flame working because it's manageable. You, yep. don't, need a, a, you don't need thousands of dollars. To you do it in your garage. Career. You could do it in your garage. Absolutely. And we're going to show you some work that was done in the garage. Yeah. Next. Next. Oh, this is fascinating, Shane. Iowa Matsushima. Matsushima does core forming. We, we didn't talk too much about it, but you saw that um, head bead earlier on, if you're with us. And uh, before the head bead, core forming is like about... 3,500 years old. It's using uh, a rod of some sort with a, a clay substance that's mixed with like animal dung and grasses and things like that. So it's like a clay and then you wrap the glass around that matrix while it's hot and then you, know, you, remove, you remove the core of it. And this is 2,000 years later when the Japanese took up core forming well, Matsushima is credited with reinventing the process. Right. He was, uh, he worked at a cultural center. He was, he saw, he was exposed to some, a collection of core form glass, was fascinated by it and reinvented, reinvented the process. But he, uh, he makes the clay, the clay molds, he, he hangs them up, he dries them, and then he wraps the, the glass around the core and then he anneals it and then he, he grinds and polishes the inside of the, the core for a smooth, uh, uh, a smooth uh, surface. Next. Yeah, I, have, I have a lot of respect for his work. And they're beautiful. The Japanese have a very restrained, a very subtle sense of excellence. And uh, his, his shallow bowl, beautiful. You can see the Latticino band, and then the gold, the gold band around the top. And then to the right, you have a core that is one of his signature pieces. They're really handsome. Next. This is... Uh... Anna Skipska's work. Um, she was a student at Krakow University in Poland, and she was an art, and I think she had interest in architectural uh, things as well. And she found pieces of glass on, she didn't have a lot of money, she found pieces of glass on the street, like plate glass, you know, window glass, and started picking them up, and you had a, got a pocket torch and started manipulating these pieces of glass, cutting them like stained glass. Actually, the professor, one of her professors, let her use on the torch. Yeah. yeah. And so she, she started her body of work in that fashion. This is a large installation. She's had a lot of major shows in major museums. Uh, next. You know, that's, a, that's amber glass. It looks like gold, yeah. you know. This um, is uh, her, she does large scale work, mostly. Yeah, sometimes like 15, 15 feet, uh, 20 feet in length. Yeah, it's they're big, remarkable. Big. They're architectural pieces, really. A uh, piece on the right, tympanum. I'm not really sure about this, but it's part of a big exhibition. I think at the Seattle, maybe Seattle Art Museum, I'm not sure about that. But, uh, then she started using uh, bullseye glass and using more colored glass, which maybe that previous piece actually was bullseye glass. Yeah. 
So this is a type of technique where you're utilizing glass either flat or in rods and you're building up larger forms in whatever your concept is. Next. This is Brent Young, Brent T. Young. And uh, Anner, I think, blazed the trail with networking glass and it opened up uh, opportunities for many, many people to be creative with that technique. Although they, they, I think she works in soda lime glass and I think more people choose to work in borosilicate glass that may be more stable. But uh, this is examples of Brent T. Young's work. <clears throat> Next. Unshu uh, Choi from uh, Korea, South Korea. Um, same kind of thing. There's so many people working in this kind of technique. It's it's a process, but it's like a kind of a whole nother thing in terms of flame working because you can build up these larger forms or smaller forms just yeah. by taking rods of glass and interconnecting them to make your forms. You can make the largest, you can make some of the largest hot glass. Of course, you know, with the clouds here, she has utilized uh, tubing, white tubing, the borosilicate yeah. and green glass for the ladders. Um, I can think- you hear my, Can you hear the rain in my background? Yeah. Let me I, think, turn, let me, I, let me I thought it was a, I thought it was a bird. Well, I have a lot of birds. <laughs> I have a lot of birds around here. Let me uh, What's, I think what's interesting is that this technique was, taught back in the 1990s at Pilchuk by Anna Skipska and yeah. Susan Plum enjoyed it. We don't have her in this presentation, but she did the same thing. I think so, that's your fault, Shane. No, it's, there's only many, so many images we can, you know, I was thinking Anna, about- This is just a casual overview. There's so much out there. I was thinking about this, that we could have, uh, we could do this once a week for 52 weeks for two hours a night, and we could probably cover the whole subject. If you exactly. want to, if you want to do it, Paul. <laughs> well, it's something to think about. Maybe do it once in a while. Okay, it's next. Right Let next. me close the door so I get less noise in here. Okay, I'll talk about Robert Mickelson here. Robert Mickelson's known for not only blowing uh, tubing and solid work, but also this kind of uh, networking technique. And um, I think that the piece on the right, which is a, a whole woman figure is maybe not life-size, but it's very large. He also has done a lot of guns uh in recent years the guns are actually called web his series is called weapons of peace he actually doesn't like guns <laughs> but he likes to uh, make them as uh, I don't know, a rebuttal against them i suppose uh, we only chose these two slides of his work but i've known him for like 35 years or something like that he's super talented and knows so many techniques and a great educator Next, um, this is somebody that's been very, very interesting. His name is Lawrence Stump, he's from California. He utilizes soft glass. He makes kind of pretty big medium sculptures uh, with the soft glass go using a torch and putting it also kind of in a furnace and he goes into the furnace with the torches to add pieces, things like that, because technically they're very difficult. Of course, the piece on the left is David, and the piece on the top are two Marinis made for Paul Stinkard of Walt Whitman. They're uh, portrait paintings, uh, James right. Joyce and uh, Walt Whitman. It's interesting, Shane, I was having an exhibition in uh, Ireland. They invited 24 American artists over to exhibit 
and it was uh, titled The Wild Geese. I think yeah, that's right. America's Wild Geese. The Irish call the people who immigrated to other countries wild geese. <laughs> so anyway, I said to Lawrence, can you make a portrait cane of James Joyce? And he said, well, who's James Joyce? I said, well, he's a distinguished uh, literary figure. He wrote uh, a masterwork called Ulysses. So uh, Lauren said with a smile, it's not, it's not Elvis Presley or Marilyn Monroe, it won't sell. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I don't care. I want to put James Joyce in a potato and, and send it over to Ireland. So I was there for the opening and I had James Joyce in a potato and nobody thought it was funny over there. <laughs> Next. Carmen Loza, what a beautiful, talented person she is. She, uh, Matt, uh, oh gosh, help me out. Her husband, Matt, uh, what's Matt's last name? Well, Urbani. Huh? Matt Urbani? No, Matt, uh, anyway, I'm sorry, Matt, I forgot Go your ahead. last name. But anyway, uh, Carmen, um, does uh, uses borosilicate glass, and actually, she's a continuation of the Nivea figurines. Right. I believe yeah. anyway, how you feel about it, Shane? No, she does kind of follow in that tradition. Next, and here's uh, examples she, she of her explain work. How she uh, makes makes them and paints them, though. Yeah, I mean, she uses borosilicate glass. She spends a tremendous amount of time working on the facial expression. I asked her once, I said, uh, Colin, how long does it take you to make a face? She said, oh, two to three hours, but a lot of times they fail. And I said, well, I can believe it because I think your faces, your expressions are as good as any have been made at the torch. So she, yeah. she makes them in borosilicate glass, she sandblasts the glass, and then paints them with oil-based paints. Next. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Boy, oh boy, I guess she had enough cherries. Fell asleep. Okay, next. Uh, this is Jay Musler and uh... <clears throat> He went, uh, he went to college, uh, he studied under Marvin Lepofsky. I think it's College of... Uh, Crap, oh. yeah, the college. Anyway. So what's the name of the college? It was, uh, anyway, I forgot. Uh, anyways, the piece on the left is actually a big blank of borosilicate glass. It's a pretty- I think it's a bell jar chain. Yeah, made out of borosilicate. And then he cut the tops out of it. Um, and he uses oil paints to paint these pieces. Um, the pieces on the right, the goblets are, are flame work pieces that are manipulated with tubing for the top part. And then the rest of it's solid, including the coil part that is uh, the base all is titled Cityscape. That's the Cityscape series. Right. You know, it was a it was a big thing, really. Well, uh, it, it won a lot it's of on the front books. cover of Suzanne France's book on yeah, uh, contemporary glass. Right. I think uh, you know the other artists were snickering because Corning produced the <laughs> Corning produces the bell chops. So huh. well, no. <laughs> That's it doesn't matter where you get your materials, it's what you do with it. Well said. Next. Ginny Ruffner, we used to call her, uh, I got to tell you, in 1988, I knew about Paul Stankard. I got the uh, issue of Glass Art Magazine, and it the front cover said, you know, something like lamp working. Uh, it's just not for county fairs anymore. 
Um, and there were four people that were featured, and it was Paul Stanker, Ginny Ruffner, uh, Susan Plum, and Patrick Goddery, who's passed away. And the whole premise of the idea was that flame working had come into being into the art world and studio glass and museum curators and galleries wanted it. And that's when I decided I wanted to meet Paul Stanker. You know, Shane, I felt, uh, you know, that I felt a negative bias towards my small scale work. Not only was it small scale, it was floral, floral motifs. And so, that, you know, that, I, and I that think, translates I think, exactly into Ginny Ruffner. I think the know. studio glass world, everybody was pushing bigger is better. Right. Well, uh, in terms of Jenny, you know, she actually, she came from a painting background. Um, she got a degree in painting. Yeah. Um, I think she has a master's degree. She got a master's degree. She wanted to work in glass, and somehow she hooked up with John Lilly in Atlanta, who was a flame worker that did scientific and kind of artistic work. And then also, after that, Hans Goto Frabel, who was well known as a flame worker, did kind of a lot of realistic pieces or kind of pop art pieces. And she learned the techniques from that. But then she slowly evolved in using that borosilicate glass in pretty large scale and painting or having people help her paint and put floral and other surrealistic uh, motifs on these pieces. So it's sand, usually sandblasted and then applied paint. And that started a whole tradition in terms of the flame working. And we used to call her uh, the queen of flame working. And she was actually the president of the Glass Art Society in 1990. Wow, and yeah, she's very active. But her, her references are literary, uh, philosophical, uh, much deeper than just actually making an object. It has to do with uh, her whole way of magical thinking about things. Yeah, there's an intellectual dimension to her. Absolutely. Her ideas. Next. This is interesting because on the left, you see a, an installation. It's like a multi-ton. I don't know how tall it is. I guess it's about 25 feet tall, a flower pot with flowers. I think that this teapot by the water sprout, I think, pours water down onto the, onto the, onto the, uh, into the pot. But that's quite a, that was, Quite a, uh, She's done a lot of it. She's done a lot of public uh, commissions. Public like installations, that. yeah. And then to the right, she's uh, incorporated metal and glass, which is very successful, very innovative. Right. It's amazing she, how... She continues to do both public installations, large-scale work with metal and glass, and still her flamework sculptures. Yeah. Next. Next. Matt Skooky. Matt's quite a quite a talented guy. He uh, he started making uh, vessels and compotes and moved on to uh, super skilled, hands. very super skilled. Yeah, he took his he took uh, he, he he told me he. He was walking home from a class he took with uh, Emilio and he well and, and Cesare. Yeah. So he was walking home. He saw a, a beer can. He picked it up and said, "I wonder if I can make this in glass." So when he made it in glass, everybody went amazed. He, he bent it, you know. And they were amazed. So that led him into what he calls white trash. And uh, it's very successful. Next. David Willis. David Willis. Very, very talented young man. Works in a variety of his, his repertoire. is very, very impressive. This is the networking technique that shows an installation that's to scale. 
And then to the right, he's got a photograph of nature, Queen Anne's lace. And then coming off the photograph is his glass, Queen Anne's lace. Pretty convincing, I'll tell you. He, you know, he is so interesting. He's an intellectual person and he's meticulous about everything he does, whether it's uh, making goblets out of tubing, which he doesn't do like commercially anymore or anything like that, but paying so much attention to detail. That yeah, really. Amazing. Noel, do we have any questions that are uh, jumping off the page? We actually do. Let me see. Let's open up this chat box. So Mimi is asking Paul a question. Um, she wants to know, have you ever thought about creating some more freeform, larger scale works like we just saw Ginny, like a standalone sculpture? Not really. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I've invested so much of my heart and soul <clears throat> into the small scale encapsulated work that occasionally I would imagine doing something and I just am addicted to the, the body of work that I'm advancing. When I, when I make a discovery, when I invent a new illusion, I'm so excited because I know that I just articulated a whole new illusion for glass history. Does that sound too egotistical? No, yeah. it doesn't. It's, it's, it's the truth. It's, but it is. It's how you feel. Yeah, and Chip, I mean, we actually have um, one for you as well um, yeah. about your watercolors. And we noticed that the bird imagery was also played out in your artwork as well as your glass. Is right. there, tell us, I know you talked about the birds being um, a reflection of 9-11, but um, what continues to draw you to the bird theme and, you know, <laughs> what's your inspiration? Well, I think that, you know, because I'm constantly seeing them and paying attention to them, I think the, the aspect of them in their movements and their song and their gesture um, just fascinate me constantly. And their color, you know, there's so many different things about them and that they can take flight. There's like a spirituality, a pureness to them. And I look through my kitchen window as I'm washing the dishes and I see a new species of bird I've never seen before. And I watch how it works. And then a cardinal, I have a female cardinal that's been coming for about three or four months and she pecks at the window in front of me. Um, I don't know, it's just the uh, animation uh, just thrills me. Plus the actual form is so aer aerodynamic, you know, kind of almost alludes to like a, taking a piece of tubing and blowing it out and moving it into a bird shape. It's so simple. So that's kind of it. Well, it's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Next slide. Micah Evans. Um, Micah Evans is a super talented guy that graduated from the University of Miami. I think he studied with uh, Robert Mickelson and different people. Um, we, we had a flamework uh, resident, I think in 1990 when I came to Penland, that did, she was from Japan, she did glass and metal. But, you know, flame working being a major medium studio at Penland didn't have a, a flame worker until Micah Evans came. And Micah Evans, so was our first full fledged flame worker at Penland. And he, you know, he does these lace techniques. He's incredible with design, um, making things like glasses and whiskey decanters and even pipes somewhat. Um, using, it, he draws out all of his designs and everything, just incredible. You can imagine how much, you know, 
time it's taken to make this sewing machine here. And I think that's one thing that he kind of developed here at Penland. Uh, he lives in Austin, Texas, and you should follow him. Uh, Micah Evans, you know, he's on Instagram and I think Facebook as well, mostly Instagram. Next. Um, I'd like to talk about Kit Paulson because it follows e exactly after Micah Evans. So Kit Paulson became uh, our second Flamework resident. And she's here right now. My wife and I uh, search for wild mushrooms to eat with her. And uh, she, she had a background in hot glass and then switched to flame working. So her ba barn owl masks, she's done lots of masks, are pieces of flame work glass that are put together kind of in a lace work type technique. Um, adding little parts, little bits, and stuff like that. Her studio is really interesting. It's like a curio cabinet kind of situation where she has all these little things that she's made. Piece on the right, Lungs, was just acquired by the Renwick uh, Museum, Smithsonian, part of the Smithsonian. Just recently, she made this just in February, pre-COVID, so it has a timely, uh, kind of a uh, narrative to it, I guess, what we're going through right now. But she is somebody that's super talented. Next. One of the main things that we wish we could cover more, or we wish we could cover so many other artists and so many other techniques, but um, one of the biggest movements in terms of flame working, there's probably 100,000 flame workers doing pipes in the United States is- I think 100,000, do you? 100,000? Yeah, I would say probably 50 to 100,000. Wow. I mean, just around Asheville, there's probably a thousand something. In Eugene, there's probably 6,000. So well, you can- Ben Roman, one of the pioneers of that aesthetic, and Clint's uh, out in uh, Oregon. Yeah, remarkable yeah, absolutely. There, you know, I mean, as marijuana has become legalized in a lot of states, you know, before it was kind of an underground movement, but they came up with a lot of uh, innovative techniques, uh, probably some of the most innovative techniques to come out of flame working. And it's even all though. All over glass, too. Pardon? For the most part, it's all borosilicate glass. Right. Although, when I was young, I knew some old timers that made pipes out of uh, soft glass <laughs> back in the oh, 60s and 70s, but yeah. not, not like this. Yeah. Anyway, you know Clinton a lot better than I do, although, so I'd like you to talk, address him. Well, you know, I met him at um, the IFC, the International Frameworking Conference at uh, Salem County Community College right. and uh, <clears throat> very, very interesting person, very attractive person, personality wise. And I became friends with him and I was invited to go to Eugene, Oregon to speak to the uh, Eugene Glass Center. And then I reconnected with uh, Clinton along with others and uh, it's fascinating to uh, to witness this energy and this this community of makers that are many of them think of themselves as outsiders outside of the studio glass movement and uh, it's interesting next <clears throat> this is Eugene Goins he's one of the leaders he does remarkable work his pipes are exquisite and uh, they're in high demand. Many of these pipe makers that uh, there's about top 20 or 30 of them are in very high demand that people collect their pipes. I don't know if they use them. They may use them, I think, but they certainly collect them. Right. Next. Matt, Matt Stroven. AKA Banjo, one of the leaders of the 
He does some very, very ambitious work. He's uh, a beautiful person, very, very talented. And uh, it's fascinating to see his approach to sculpting glass, sculpting functional glass, because this is, for the most part, all functional glass. And uh, I think that some of them are so, so beautiful, I don't know if I'd want to use it. <laughs> Put it on a shelf and admire it. <clears throat> Next. So here we go, we're ending, the, we're coming to the end, but I'm a, a very, I'm a graduate of Salem Community College, graduated in 63, and they have a glass program that's been ongoing for 60 years or so, and they make laboratory apparatus. So this is uh, referencing the glass, the laboratory glass equipment used in industry and in research. And the, and the glass center has about uh, facilities for 40, 40 benches. Plus they have glass blowing, glass casting, enameling. I mean, it's quite a program. It's a two year program that you get an associate's degree in glass. And, but you can also, uh, many of the students stay for a third year. They take scientific glass blowing and then they take a year of glass, scientific lamp working or flame working. And then they take a year of glass blowing. So it's very, very successful. And, and uh, I'm proud to be associated with it as artist in resident. Next. Shane, you're up. Um, in, uh, when I came here in 1988, um, and I was like a teaching assistant with Fred Burkill, and then I took Stephen uh, D. Edwards class, and the next year I was invited back as a visiting artist for Fred Bur Bur Burkill, and then uh, later on the summer I came back for Paul Marioni's class. Um, I decided with my wife, we, she had come up here. We liked the mountains in North Carolina and we decided we wanted to move here. So in 1990, I was asked to teach, co-teach with Fred Burkill. And we decided to leave Florida, which is where we were living. And at that time, Paul Stankard had taught um, one of the major workshops in flame work in 1986, where all the masters and uh, of the area and other people came to Penland to take Paul's first public class. There wasn't hardly any flame working classes. Uh, they were taught just a couple, wasn't a flame working program. The director at the time, Hunter Carrier in 1990, when I moved here said, why don't you put together a full fledged flame working program? And I said, sure. And we didn't, there wasn't programs at Corning Museum. There wasn't programs anywhere. There was a couple classes here and there, maybe every summer at Pilchuck as there was at Penland. So I helped develop the program here. I asked friends to teach uh, people that hadn't taught before, Robert Mickelson, people from different countries, and it developed into a, a successful program. The funny thing is uh, about it, as a little aside, was that the flame working program actually made money because it was so economical and the hot glass program actually lost money because they had to run those furnaces. <laughs> so come to Penland when you can. It's closed for now. Sure. Next. I think that might be it, Shane. Well, oh no, this is... Uh... This is something important to us. You can explain this. Okay. Um, Cesare Tofolo, we showed his slides earlier, is not only a fantastic artist himself, but like us, he, he's a scholar. And he wrote these series of books. He wrote this, uh, <clears throat> kind of worked on this book with Sandra Zayan, this volume one in volume two and volume three. So if you want to know anything about flame working, there's some other books that are pretty good, a little bit good about history, 
but I think these are the definitive books that you could possibly learn about flame working. And they were, the third volume was just finished about a year ago. The other two were finished in 2018. And so they involve different aspects of flame working from the absolute beginning to contemporary times. Um, they're about a hundred dollars a piece, but they're beautifully done. And I think they're worth it. If you would like to buy them, you can buy them directly through him. You can go to his website, Cesare Tofolo. I think it's info at Cesare, uh, Tofolo Studios. Uh, or the Corning Museum shop sells them, or I have some copies. And I, I highly suggest if you want to know anything. The pieces that are on volume two and volume three are actually made in Laosha, uh, made from tubing. Did you know that, Paul? I, I assume so. Yeah. So um, anyways, and of course, we know what's on the first volume there. Anyways, that's what I have to say about it. If you want to contact me about it, just contact me at shanefarrow.com. Thank you. You know, uh, it's really been a pleasure for Shane and I to offer this overview. It's, it's rich with, with beauty and uh, talented people. The marketplace, we didn't talk a little, we should talk a little bit about the marketplace. Noel, how much time do we have? Are we running out of time? We're actually running out of time, Paul. We're past eight o'clock. So okay. I guess so it's kind of last, last statements. And um, I just wanted to pass on, we're getting a lot of thank yous. And um, in the comment section, people are really enjoying the program and wanted to thank you both for sharing your knowledge. So just, there's a lot of love coming through and I'm just Thanks passing on the love. <laughs> well, we'll have to do it again, Shane, uh, maybe uh, next year or something. But, you know, the market I do it. I told you we could have a weekly broadcast. I don't know about that. But, uh, <laughs> That's an excellent idea. Uh, yes. And I that. wanted to say that I did put those links to the books in the... I in noticed the that. Thank you so much. So, again, anybody that wants those, um, wants to... Um, have the chat they can um, send us an email um, I put your websites in the um, chat I also put I, I did not put um, Noel and my information um, in there but uh, we we can continue to answer some of those questions and I just wanted to thank you both very 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 much um, I did want to say, Paul, one thing that you were going to talk about, um, if you wanted to touch on it real briefely before we close, was the um, Creative Glass Center and Wheaton Fellowship. Oh, my uh, goodness. You know, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know if you wanted sorry. to mention that before we, we signed off, but sure. I thought. Well, you know, uh, you know, being close to Wheaton, Wheaton Arts and being involved with the Creative Glass Center of America at Wheaton Arts, I've had an opportunity to meet, I met Lucho in 93. I've had an opportunity to meet uh, hundreds of artists who, and from all over the world. And I would enjoy going to the village, as we call it the village, going to the art center, helping out, you know, um, inviting them to my studio and having, having dinner and talking glass, sharing my flame working, uh, uh, process. So Wheaton has really been a remarkable resource, not only for me, which I, I graduated, I mean, Wheaton allowed me to reach my full potential as a, as a artist in glass, but it helps so many other people. It's really all over the world, <laughs> all over the world. All people over the world. You know, in, in southern New Jersey, we have Salem Community College, their glass program, Wheaton Arts. We have the glass industry. A lot of the students from Salem are working in the, in the scientific glass industry. And then there's others that are doing uh, creative work. So it's really uh, a community that's, that's 
uh, composed of talented people and and the support that Wheaton Arts offers the artists is remarkable. It really is. We had the honor of featuring Shane Farrow at one of our glass weekends as well. Yes, yes. Right. I just also wanted to thank you both um, for having your work here in the gallery for all these years. It's been a pleasure to, always a pleasure to represent your work and have people from all over come in and, and see your work and just the face lights up. So it's just, it's a joy to share your work with, with everyone that comes through. So well, thank I'm going to tell you a secret. Thank you so much. <laughs> Whenever you sell one you. of the pieces, uh, Pat and I go to the local custard stand and we have a custard. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. With a, a custard. I, I, Pat has, I have Pat, my wife, Pat, God bless her. She has more willpower than I do. I get hot fudge on my custard. And, uh, <laughs> that's really sweet, Paul. Very Thank nice. you. Nice. I didn't know that all these years. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we have a, a, a custard stand in Mantua called Dippies. <laughs> Dippies. <laughs> Dippies is a place to go. So, well, if, any of our viewer, if any of our viewers have suggestions on further content or programs, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so jot down our information here. And I also um, put another reminder, the link for Wendell White and Glennis Reed, our next Wheaton conversation on the 24th of September, another Thursday night at 6 p.m. And again, I just want to thank you all, and, and, and it's such a pleasure. Thank you, Masi, for pulling Thank you. Me. Wonderful. I don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We could just stay for another hour. <laughs> we have I'll, to call you at I'll call you at 6.30 tomorrow morning, Paul. There you go. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye for now. Bye-bye. To the participants. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.